to look at the universe and see all of the forces, the heavy ones, the light ones, the destructive ones, the creative ones, to find what your part is in it. And if your part is that of the bodhisattva, that of reducing the suffering of all human beings, and that's all your work is, you just do it and do it and do it until there is no you in there. There is merely this instrument for the relieving of suffering of all beings. And that is one of the parts of the dance, of which another and equally important of the dance is that which creates all the suffering in you. That's what's so far out about it. Welcome, everyone, to another Ramdas Here and Now episode. I'm Jackie Dobrinska, your host, and you, you all are the Ramdas Satsang, the sacred community. Today, we are diving into episode 220, Hearing Your Dharma, Hearing Your Part. Dharma is always this complex topic, and it's also one of the most popular because I think most people are concerned about knowing what is theirs to do, what is the reason the atra, sorry about my French, um, but that reason for being. I think our culture often conflates like purpose with career or job or even role. But in this episode, Ram Das reminds us that there's so much more to it than that. And there's many layers and pieces. You know, he talks about uh, this tendency we have to fall into polarities, what we consider right or wrong or good or bad. And that the divine perfection has many, many faces, and some of them, you know, seem prettier from our point of view um, than others. He talks about it in terms of rays, um, and I think about like the Jesus or Savior ray, or the Judah, um, or like betrayer ray, or the Mary or forgotten one ray, um, and all the many others, and that some of them, like Judah or Shiva. Uh, they carry this heavier karma. But he reminds us that even if someone carries a heavier karma, and in this uh, episode he talks about Nixon, but we could extrapolate that to anyone in our time, that it doesn't give us permission to ignore the soul behind the role. You know, that he has that quote of, um, do what you do with another person, but don't kick them out of your heart. I think it's, I don't think it's Hafiz, maybe it's Kabir. Um, but just that idea of we don't forget the soul, even if the role isn't what we like it to be. Um, he also reminds us that in the face of heavy worldly predicaments, like whatever it is we see in the news or environmental issues, that we need not fall into inaction or apathy. Uh, instead, just to know that part of our dharma are these small acts um, it might be something like planting a garden or, I don't know, maybe we give up plastic for a month. But each one of these is one of the fingers of the 10,000 armed goddess of compassion. Um, and that that's part of our work. This idea that, and he says it here, and he says it in his book, How Can I Help? That our work is to end suffering without attachment to whether suffering ends. He also talks about uh, these four qualities to know and live our dharma. He mentions one of them by name and sort of points at the other three. And one is this ability to get quiet so we can really hear that inner voice, what the yogis would call di or prajna, like just a really deep sense of knowing. Um, he talks about shraddha or faith, to trust that knowing. Uh, smriti is this idea of remembering who we truly are beyond our egos and melodramas. And virya is courage, this courage to embrace our wholeness, which includes the light and dark. And he talks about the holy phony that he would put on at times and to sort of move out from underneath of that. And also the courage to embrace the light and dark of the world as it is without pushing away suffering or um, denying it in any way. And he also talks about, um, you know, in a roundabout way, how we're not going to do it perfectly. Uh, it reminded me of this talk from Maui where Duncan Trussell was in a conversation with several others about selfless service. And he's like, you know, if I'm drowning and someone comes out to save me, I'm not going to ask them if their motives are pure. Like if they want a hundred bucks, I'll give them a hundred bucks. 
And in that same sense, I think of as we listen for what's ours to do, we're not going to do it perfectly. And that's just part of the unfolding. So two quick notes about this episode. First is about sound. About two-thirds of the way through when he's talking about faith, the audio goes wonky for a few seconds, and our sound guys couldn't like seamlessly cut this out. So just be patient. It's only a couple of seconds. Um, and then also just a bit of a trigger warning. So Ramdas holds up the Buddhist teacher Trungpa Rinpoche, who was known as the 11th incarnation of the Trungpa Tulka. And he taught that every aspect of human existence was to be embraced and transmitted. Transmuted. Um, he also openly slept with many students and uh, died of alcoholism in 1986 at the age of 47. So it's up to you what planes you want to hear this from. If his methods were indeed crazy wisdom or if it was power abuse or denial or some combination of all of it. If you want to know more details about him, the light and dark of his methods, you might consider checking out uh, the Chronicles of Trumpa Rinpoche, as well as an article in Tri Tricycle magazine called Encountering the Shadow in Buddhist America. So um, he and Ramdas uh, taught in the early 70s together at the very, very beginning of Naropa University. And uh, in Ramdas's portion of it, he was teaching about the Bhagavad Gita, which is a lot of what this talk is about. Last year, we turned that uh, series of lectures into a course. Um, so if you want to dive deeper into the Gita, um, go to ramdas.org slash course. And you, if you get a subscription, you get that as well as many, many other brilliant courses. So I encourage you to check that out. As always, you are invited to talk more about this episode at our virtual satsang gatherings. Uh, to find the next one, you go to ramdas.org slash events for details, or you just go to ramdas.org slash fellowship and you sign up and then the invite will come directly into your inbox. So as always, whatever good may come from these teachings, may it benefit all of us in our daily lives and ripple out into the world. We thank each of you for being here as well as all of the many people that made this possible, including our sound guys, our archive guys, those of you who donate, and of course, our sponsors. Thanks for being here. Enjoy. Namaste and blessings. We find ourselves in a very um, interesting predicament at this moment in, uh, in the um, illusion of time. It seems apparent since uh, 10 years ago, this kind of an audience wouldn't gather to sit around and talk about, quote, spiritual subjects, that something is afoot without getting too astrally melodramatic about the Aquarian bloop or the, you know, whatever. Something's happening. There's not much doubt about it. But what is also equally apparent is that the whole system, the game, which includes Navritti and Pravitti, which includes the force that is the force of the many returning to the one or becoming conscious of the oneness, which of course also is an illusion, is being fed great energy, but similarly, the other force, the force that's going from the one into the many, that's increasing the paranoia, the separateness, the illusion, the anger, the frustration, the neurosis, the, the the horror of it all, that's also being fed incredible energy. And in a way, you see, the energy curve is like a geometric curve. It's like almost going straight up at this point. And we're all experiencing more and more energy. And if you just hang around satsang, you say, it's amazing. God is manifesting, taking over the world. The light is all manifesting. But if you pick up a paper, you say, oh, my God, the whole thing's going under. I mean, there are, there are facts that we must face that about ecology that are so horrible. I mean, it's, 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 it's getting clear now that the problem isn't going to be energy, the problem is going to be food. And that like within uh, 10 years, uh, billions of people are going to die of starvation. Even if everybody shares everything, theoretically.
And it's very hard when the intensity of the game gets so high, when there's so much energy in the system, not to get caught in the good and evil polarity because it's finding each of our prices. I mean, each man has a price or each woman has a price. And when the thing gets too heavy, like when the police state gets too oppressive, people get caught in being angry. When your buddies go to prison, like two of my friends just went to prison for 15 and 20 years for manufacturing LSD, supposedly. And it's hard not to get into why that judge, he, oh, I'd like to, you know, I'm going to send him a hate letter. Or at a more conscious level, getting into, well, I'm going to become a candidate for, and I'm going to be involved in local politics and start to change the game. Now, that may be beautiful or it may be horrible, depending on where you're doing it from. If you're doing it out of anger or out of being caught in the polarity, you're just perpetuating the horrible melodrama. The game only gets... harmonious. At the point where, though we play with full involvement, we are sitting totally behind it, ever present, with no attachment. Total involvement, but no attachment. Like one of the conclusions of the ecological predicament is local gardens and local government. And I can see, I can imagine myself being involved in the next few years in finding a way to grow a garden and to become involved in the local scene. Now, I'm doing this not because, and this is a very tricky point about what's called the bodhisattva vow, I'm doing this not because I think good is going to prevail or that it must prevail. Because to me, all of the forces are manifestations of the faces of God. But I'm doing it because that's what I do. That's my part in it. Now we're coming to the meaning of the term dharma. Because to hear your dharma means to hear what part you play in the total panoramic vision of the way in which the universe is. If those of you that have read the Bhagavad Gita, here is Arjuna, who's a really nice guy. Arjuna is a good family man. He's a good warrior. He's a really good guy, and he fights for right. And he's about to start this battle, and he's sitting with Krishna, who happens to be his charioteer and also happens to be God. And he looks at the other side of the, who he's going to fight, and he says, oh, he throws down his spear, and he says, I'm not going to fight. He says, because for me to fight would mean that I have to go against every single thing I believe. Because I would be killing my aunts, my uncles, and my... Uh, teachers and all my friends because of the other side are full of good people too. I'm not going to fight Krishna. I, I don't care. I'm giving up. Because even if I win, this thing will be so drenched in blood, the whole family structure will be destroyed. Everything that ever meant anything to me will be gone. And Krishna says to him, which is the rest of the Gita, hey man, you don't have any choice. And then Krishna shows him how, in effect, it's all happened already. Because Krishna gives him the vision to see the future as well as the present. And Krishna shows him who Krishna is and manifests at one point as this huge open jaw in which the warriors are crushing in and their teeth, their heads are getting crushed against his teeth. 
which in Hinduism is called the Shiva aspect. And here he's saying to Arjuna, you are going to have to be an instrument of the Shiva aspect of God. That is, you're going to have to be an instrument of the destructive component of the whole thing. Because if you look at nature, if you will notice in nature, things are created, they are preserved, and then they destroy. Stuff grows, it flowers, and it rots. All of us are born... We grow up, we get old, sick, and weak, and we die. Isn't that far out? I mean, if it's all so beautiful, you realize that the last quarter of almost everybody's life is in pain, in fear, in suffering, and in horror. That was Buddha's point in his Four Noble Truths. Is that godless? Is there no plan? Is it total randomness? What's the story? Now, if you can recognize all these different aspects of the dance, it's like, um, I'm not saying, uh, there's an interesting thing. In the Ramayana, the story of Ram, Ram does battle with Ravana, who's the bad guy. Ravana is a lot like Nixon was at the moment of his last election, right? Landslide victory, he's the king. He's four more years, right? And he says, I was talking to Trisha and she said, Daddy, isn't it too bad? This will be your last campaign. And everybody shouted, no, no, no. And he was sitting there having made it. And he had, in Ravana's case, Ravana has ten heads. And they're all ego. And Ravana says, I am the ruler of all the worlds. Look on my works, ye mighty in despair. That's Ozymandias' line, but it's the same, roughly the same one. And he's, he's, so, he's so scary that everybody's afraid of him. And he gets so pompous that he decides to rip off Ram's wife, God's wife. He's going to get the Shakti of the universe. So he steals Sita, the wife, and he takes her to his island and he says, okay, I want you to make it with me. This is God's wife now. And she says, over my dead body. She says, you're nothing but a firefly compared to the sun. What, what are you, are you kidding me? She says, cut off my head with your knife. That's the closest you're going to get to me. Because once you've made it with God, all the rest is kind of irrelevant. That's what a lot of us are finding, you see. That's our predicament. We try to make it real, but it doesn't quite come off. Now, the interesting aside about Ravana is that Ravana was actually a very high yogi in his previous birth. But he had a little heavy work to finish off, so he became Ravana, but he was due to be fully enlightened in this birth, which was going to happen by being killed by God. Because if you get killed by God, you get fully enlightened. Right? Hear that? In other words, they said to him, okay, Ravana, we got this heavy part. Um, you've got to play Iago. See? And um, Jesus, I played that last week. You've got to play it again. See? But it's okay, because if you do that, you're going to get a raise. So now, who's Nixon? It's an interesting question, see? I mean, which angle do you look from? See? And at one level, it's a tremendously poignant predicament. It is what is known as heavy karma. Very, very, just about the heavy, I mean, Vietnam was about the heaviest karma that a man could, could have. Now, whether or not you are perpetuating the same karma determines, is determined by how you react to a being like Nixon. Because Nixon, Richard Milhouse Nixon, is a package. 
And in that package is another being just like you and just like me. That far out? It's sitting back in there and it's screaming, here I am, but nobody's listening, including the package. I did a television show about a year ago in New York with Ultraviolet, who used to be with um, Andy Warhol. And um, Ultra and I, I guess you call her Ultra, um, were talking about this issue. And we decided we really had to, I said, the only way you could free Nixon to become compassionate was to look behind the mask to the being back there and make contact with that being without demanding he be other than he is because he's really just playing his part in the drama. And then he's free to change. But the minute you treat somebody in terms of their role, you lock them into their role and they can't change. So the game is to look behind it. So we were trying to look into the television camera and look behind the Richard Nixon that we both were very upset about and look back and say, we love you, Richard. And I said, Ultra, I don't hear the feeling in your voice. Let's try it again. Now, I don't want Nixon's part. I don't even want my part. I mean, all parts are just parts. But what the Dharma means is that you hear quietly, as you quiet down, you begin to hear what your part is in the whole operation. And you begin to play it, not out of a self-conscious, I think I'll do this now, but just because it feels Taoist, it feels harmonious, it feels in the flow. So that one woman will say, I'm not going to have children, and when she says it, it feels just like the Earth Mother speaking, and another one says, I'm not going to have children, and you just hear hysteria. Somebody else says, my work is to have children, and you feel right on, and somebody else says, my work is to have children, and it feels weird. Because there is no form, there is no single form, there's no holy trip. You can't be like Buddha or be like Christ. That isn't the game. The game is to be what you need to be, which is follow your natural course, but do it with the space, the inner space that's quiet enough to hear what your natural course is, not head trip your way into it. Because every time you head trip your way into it, you keep alienating yourself from it. Don Juan says, it is the art of a warrior to balance the terror of being a man with the wonder of being a man and a woman. That as you provide space inside, which comes through meditation, it comes through mantra, it comes through devotion, it comes through whatever your quote, yogic technique is. Once there's that little space, you begin to be awed at the total exquisiteness of the design of it all. And you begin to see what would be called the awful compassion of it. When you get behind your own romanticizing of your life and everybody else's life, you merely see the unfolding of the laws of the universe and you see layer upon layer, each more awesome than the last, until when you're back here, every pebble and every, every form on this plane becomes some kind of pure spirit being manifested. And it's just awful. It's full of awe. And the terror of it is you also look at the total impersonality of it. And that it may well be that we are in the Kali Yuga 
and that we are just before the pralaya, and at some moment the whole thing is going to go up. And this is all going to be over just like that. And when it's all over, here we'll all still be. Isn't that fun? Then we'll say, wasn't that one far out? Oh, boy, that's got the exorcist beat. That really took me on a trip. I really thought it was real. But knowing that cute up level doesn't, there's no way you can drop out of this round. You can't drop out. That's the far out thing. Try it. What are you going to do? Well, uh, won't do anything. Well, that's an interesting thing to do. Then what are you going to do? Because there isn't any way to drop out. All you can do is be quiet enough to hear on every plane what your part is and play it with compassion and with love and with openness and with humanity. Now, I'm dealing with people these days like Trungpa Rinpoche, who comes drunk to his lectures, screws all his devotees. He's a wild man. He's a great lama. You know, either he's a total mashugana or... He's an exquisite statement of Dorje Trollo, of one of the faces of Padmasambhava, which is the angry deity who is the compassion to cut through all of our stuff. Because what other holy man do you know that comes drunk to his lectures and screws all his women's devotees? Well, most of them. Uh, no. no. <laughs> See, a question yeah, is he pure? far out. Could it be, I mean, could it be, or is that, no, it doesn't fit into my rule book of gurus. There is nothing in, there's nothing even under subcategory C that allows for, for that. He must be, it must be the work of the devil. Now, what's happened uh, in the training that I've been subjected to, which has involved coming into contact with a number of people who have great powers and who reflect very different aspects of the dance than the aspect that, that is whatever my dharma is. Uh, those of you that are familiar with Alice Bailey and the Theosophists are familiar with the concept of rays. Or we could talk about archetypes. Like on this plane, or if you like astral signs, how about those, 12 astral signs? Like on this plane, there are all of us, and every single one of us has a different thumbprint, has some unique individuality. But we can say, people come up to me and say, I bet you're an Aries. And I say, yes. And they say, I knew it. I knew it. Okay. Like the old psychology days when somebody says, I bet you're a high PD, low HY on the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory. <laughs> and on the astral planes, each of us have our identities also. And what the transformations that occur in most of us are, are that we start to divest our attached emotional romantic involvement in this particular package. Now, at first, we might buy into a Buddhist um, thing at the wrong level and say, it's all void, it's nothing, okay? which is just another place, by the way. It's not that either. And in order to extricate ourselves from the somethingness, we try to attach ourselves to nothingness, which then becomes something. But as we extract ourselves from so much identity with being Sam, Frida, Joan, or Mary, 
we begin to recognize that we are being transformed, if you will, into our archetypal selves. If you look at the pyramid, the one on the top, then it goes into the two, the yin and the yang, and then it starts to go into the three, five, seven, nine, twelve, bloop, 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 till it gets to us. And every one of us is one of those rays going all the way back to the yin yang and back to the one. Now, my training from my guru is sub ek, meaning it's all one. Sub ek, there's only one. Meaning, keep your eye on the top of the pyramid. Don't get caught in the astral melodrama. Okay. And by keeping your eye on the top of the mark, of the point up there, the peak, and cleaning away all the stuff by purification, by calming, by centering, by being honest with yourself when you're done with stuff, by running through your trips consciously, all this stuff, as you start of lighten and let go and let go, you're aiming towards the one, and you're slowly merging into this one. But in the course of it, you are going to not go through all of these different paths. You're going to go through one of these paths. And these paths aren't just practices. They are actually identities. And so you're going to find you are on the Christ trip, or you are on the Shiva trip. And those are very different aspects. They're different rays. And the interesting training that I've been finding myself subjected to is coming in contact with very, very evolved beings who represent different rays than the one I do. And finding the seductiveness of that ray and then going in under it and then feeling, no, it's not right in my heart, and then feeling I've got to pull back and find my own way more. Now, that's what I would call taking teachings instead of getting hung up about a teacher. That is, each of us has work to do, like, to the extent that you're afraid of chaos, to the extent that you're afraid of death, to the extent that you're afraid of pain and suffering, you've got work to do. One of the things I do, for example, is I sit with people that are dying. And that really, they teach me a hell of a lot. Or I'm with somebody who, when somebody dies, they say, well, that, that was interesting. Like Maharaji laughing. I mean, my guru laughed at death. Somebody he loved and loved him. Like I was getting all involved in setting up these centers for dying. That is trying to create spaces where people could consciously come to die. And recently I was in retreat for seven weeks out in the desert. I went out in my VW bus and I camped out in the desert by myself. And I just, because um, doing this and interacting when you're just somebody else on the path, you pick up a lot of stuff along the way. And then you've got to quiet down to reconnect. For me, I do anyway. And so I needed to go off in the desert for a while. And when I got quieter, I heard... Cool it, don't rush so fast into that. You're not ready. You're not ready because you've still got stuff to do about dying yourself. And if I've still got stuff to do about dying and I go create huge superstructures to help people die, all I'm doing is creating superstructures of illusion. Because no matter how subtle it is, all I'm transmitting is my own fear. Because the funny thing is, you transmit to other people not all the nice words you say, but your own being, whatever that is. And you could be a bus driver and just handing the change and you are transmitting the Buddha nature. I mean, I can go, I went into a restaurant and I was served by somebody who was so beautiful that I just felt like I had been in the presence of a saintly being. I just got suddenly energy poured into me from this being. And all the being was doing was pouring me a cup of coffee. And all I said was, thank you. And here's the 15 cents. And thank you. And I went and sat down. There was no more. There wasn't, you're Buddha. I know who you are. Don't kid me.
so that listening is to listen to hear what part you're playing. And I have met so many beings, like my relations with Tim Leary, were an example of somebody who I, I worked with for many years who represented a different ray than I do. If you read Terra 2, his, uh, his new book, you will see that he, he speaks about different stuff than I do. That doesn't mean one of us is a bad guy. It merely means we re represent different aspects of the dance. And then you have to listen to your heart about what your work is with somebody who is in a different aspect. Sometimes you have at work to do because you're freaked by that aspect. And if you're busy being attached by wanting it or wanting to get rid of it, you got work to do. And sometimes you can look at a different aspect and say, I honor you. I love you. You do your work. I do my work. And it's okay. There's no uh, attachment. There's no clinging. To look at the universe and see all of the forces, the heavy ones, the light ones, the destructive ones, the creative ones, to find what your part is in it. And if your part is that of the bodhisattva, that of reducing the suffering of all human beings, and that's all your work is, you just do it and do it and do it until there is no you in there, there is merely this instrument for the relieving of suffering of all beings, and that is one of the parts of the dance, of which another and equally important of the dance is that which creates all the suffering in the universe. That's what's so far out about it. See, there's a very complex, like the other day I went um, hang, flying, what's it called, hang, sailing? I, with Stuart Brand, he um, took me out and I, I'm still all black and blue from my um, attempt to become a bird. But it was, a, it was something. What it was, I don't know. But it was, um, Now, when Stuart and I spend time together, we're very fond of one another. And I really just went out to be with Stuart for the day because I really dig Stuart. Stuart is really what would be called a utopianist. And I am what you might call a mystic. Stuart, as represented in the Whole Earth Catalog and now his new venture called the Coevolution Quarterly, is working full-time to make it beautiful now for everybody. That's the game. And I said to him, well, Stuart, do you care that it be beautiful for everyone now? And he said, yes. And I said, well, there's the problem. Not that you do it. I mean, I dig being a utopianist but with it, without attachment. See, the predicament of having the, the inner strength and the inner courage, and this is the thing Don Juan's talking about, the ability to see the horror of it, the terror of it, to see the forces equal and opposite always, and realize, as Buddha pointed out, that as long as this plane exists, which has on it people who desire anything, there will be suffering. And at the same time, to work full time for a utopian existence, for a place where there is no suffering. See, there's the place where it comes together, where you work full time to end suffering, knowing damn well the suffering is going to continue. Without getting disillusioned, because you've already been through that. Because, as the Gita says, you are not attached to your goals. You are merely doing it as an offering to God because that's your part in the dance of making God manifest on earth. And that's what it's about. I just spent two days, three days with Wavy Gravy, who's a very dear friend. 
And Wavy said to me, I was having Wavy read the third Chinese patriarch, which um, tells you not to be attached and not to be attached to not being attached and so on. And Wavy says, well, can I care? Can I choose? Can I choose to choose? Can I choose to care? I said, not the way you're saying it, Wavy. Like when you meet another person who has given space to it all, you meet them and they might be in the middle, you might be at the moment like um, in the middle of sandbagging a dike to keep the waves from crashing in at a moment of incredible crisis. And you look into their eyes and they are totally right here, empty, compassionate, loving, full, nothing. Oh, you here? I'm here. Far out. <laughs> You don't even stop in midstream. The sandbags are going, but the eyes meet, and it's nothing. And that's the quality of my relation with Trungpa Rinpoche. He's doing this dance that, my God, he's practically eating burning swords. But when I look in his eyes, there's, you here, I'm here, far out. You know, and then, whoosh, whoosh. I mean, he freaks me completely at that level. And there I am being freaked, and he's freaking me, and we look at each other, and I, far out, you here, I'm here, far out. I'm freaked, right. I'm freaking, right, and here we are. Most of us have gone through um, realizing that we were connected to a dance that was much more than we had been led to believe that life was about, which made us grab at and cling to a lot of models that were available, many of which came from the East. And then very slowly we have been developing our own models or buying from the East that which is usable and rejecting that which isn't or getting to the point where we realized that we had to just get our scene together. And so many of us are just getting our scenes together. And we got holy too fast. We got into Zumbach's suit. And then we have to go back, and we go back, and suddenly you look at somebody who was all in white being a vegetarian wisp of light, and you find them in a bar with you drinking and eating a steak. Okay? And they look at you and they, there's a slight defiant look and a slight, you know, it's like. See, the first time I decided that I had been a little phony holy, see, I noticed that I still was craving foods that I wasn't supposed to eat. So I remember the first time I decided, look, what am I afraid of the devil? Like, I've been... What I've done is I've been vegetarian for six years, and I'm busy with, like, marks on my sleeve. You know, I'm a six-year vegetarian. How long have you been a vegetarian? <laughs> so I decided, well, the hell with this. I've just got to break my own record so I can get on with it, you know. So I went into a Chinese restaurant, and I picked a very out-of-the-way one. <laughs> with the dark, um, dark lights, you know. And I went and I decided, I'll really go whole hog because I'm a Jew and a Hindu, I'll order spear ribs because that really does it at all levels. You know? And if God's going to strike me dead, he'll do it right in this Chinese restaurant and the whole thing will be over. So I sit down and I start to eat my spear ribs, which I'm enjoying thoroughly. I've offered them to Maharaji, by the way. I say, Maharaji, I know you'll find this strange. <laughs> and then I crack up completely. <laughs> Since he is the spear ribs and me eating them too. So there's uh, many levels of humor in that hole. And you're only eating yourself and the whole thing is bizarre. You know? There's a guy at the next booth, and he's in a suit and a tie, and he's just finishing his lunch, and he's facing me in the next booth, and he's, I bless the food, you know, I'm holding the plate of spear ribs and offering them to God, and he watches this whole thing, and then I eat, and then afterwards he says, uh, 
excuse me, could I come over and talk to you? And I finished my spirit. I said, certainly. And he comes over, he sits down, and he says, I'm a salesman for an electronics equipment company from MIT. And um, he said, I couldn't help noticing the way you offered the food. He said, the spirit was so powerful, it affected me tremendously. And he said, I just wanted to come over to share with you a moment of the spirit and to thank you for doing that. So it turned out that he was a fundamentalist Christian, and we had a long talk about Christ and the Bible, and, and he was telling me about how at times he's kind of hip hypocritical. He'll be in a bar, and there'll be a beautiful girl, and he'll talk to her, and she'll be upset, and he'll say, well, let me talk to you about the Bible, and really he wants to make it with her. And we were going through all that stuff, which everybody goes through, I'm sure. I mean, we all deal with that stuff. <sighs> It's all going to be out front. I mean, there's no... Who are you going to, who are you going to hide from? You know, you're all the guru. What the hell? So finally, he says, well, it's, we would talk for about an hour, and he says, this has been a thrilling conversation. He says, I, I just feel so honored having met you. Could you tell me one thing? Could you tell me what you eat? What's your diet? Okay. And I looked down, and there's a big pile of bones. <laughs> Now, you see, it's very complicated about diet because there are stages, like if you're trying to do, say, kundalini yoga, you've got to watch every morsel that goes into your mouth because if you try to do pranayam and you don't care, be very careful about your diet, you're really going to blow your scene of your body, of this incarnation. So that when you're doing certain kinds of yoga, certain kinds of sadhana, certain diets are required. Also, at certain places, you get, like through meditation, you'll get to a very delicate space where everything you put into your body, you'll really recognize that statement, you are what you eat, and you'll notice the vibration of animals that have died violently in your body. Then there are other times when your, your stage is different. I mean, like, it is very clear, like, Tibetans have always eaten meat, and they're certainly as high as anybody else I know. Now you say, well, they had to eat meat because they were up in the mountains, but meat is meat. Now, all I'm saying is the diet, just like everything else, you've got to listen in your heart to hear what you particularly need as your sadhana. What we tended to do was get very fanatic about the diet and let all the rest go to hell. We got much more purist about our diets than we did about the rest of the game. And we've got to bring it all together. You can't have lustful sex and be a macrobiotic and think you're making it. See? The sex has to be as conscious as the, the, um, the rice you put in the pot. You put pot, rice in the pot with mantra, and then a girl walks in the room and you, you know. Okay. And somehow that's off limits because it's not my diet, you know. Okay. Now, the predicament is that all of us are in transformation at this point. That's what you're doing here, I assume, unless you come here to bless us. Or unless you came in by mistake and you're sitting in the middle and you can't get out. Okay. Those are the three alternatives of what you're doing here, all right? And if you are in the process along with the rest of us, and you are not by definition sitting in a cave in the Himalayas at this moment, you, like I, am dealing with the stuff of daily life in the marketplace. And the fire burns hot. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And that's great because the hotter the fire, the faster the purification. And the only fear you have is you're going to go under. But the fact is you can't go under. That's the one that's so far out. You can think you went under. You can really scare yourself. Oh, I went under. But in fact, if you give yourself that little space again, you come right back up again. And you'll see that it only, that the fire is only really hot when you risk going under. You can protect your game. You can protect, it's like, a, protect a small investment. Like I can sit up in a cave in the mountains and I, like I was sitting out in the desert 
and I got so holy, I mean, the cactus were all luminous, and I was seeing visions clearly, and I saw how it all was, and I was totally not attached, and I was full of love and compassion. It was all beautiful. And I saw a wolf, and I loved it, and the wolf loved me, and it was, oh, it was incredibly spacey. Right? And I, boy, that's who I am. And then I started to drive from Arizona, and I did it slowly. I went to Joshua Tree for a couple of weeks to slowly. Then I ended up coming through Los Angeles. But I didn't stop because that might have been a little heavy, so I kept right on going. And I came right up and I settled in the Bay Area, where it's, it's all satsang, isn't it? And I think, oh, I can eat fire. I can handle all this. And uh, yesterday, Krishna Das said to me, um, I think you ought to go off by yourself for a day. I said, you think I'm paranoid? He says, yeah, totally. <laughs> so I did. I've just been in Samuel Taylor State Park for overnight. Just came here from the park. I went to cool myself out so I could be here. Because uh, yesterday I was... God says you should do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly, that's the way I was coming on. <laughs> now, even when you're in the middle of that hell, Loka, you know, here we are, like I could say to Krishna Das, do you think I'm paranoid? And he could say, yes, and who's that talking to who? That's not paranoia. That's the other place. So it's okay. I mean, I'm not afraid I'm going under it. All the faith. See, that's the issue. The whole thing is shraddha of faith. And at first, your faith is very flickery, so you keep needing your uh, connection. You've got to rush to the guru, or you've got to have satsang, or you've got to have a pure this, or a little picture, or run to your puja table, or do your, your arti every night, or whatever the trip is, or wear your medallion, or whatever the thing is you need. Up until then, you've felt you're a schnook that's hanging on to this high thing by dear life, and you've, you've gotten into the door by cheating somehow, and you're holding on, see? Isn't that true? I mean, am I talking the way you... And then this other space, you start to think, because all these books have been saying it. They keep saying, you are it. You say, and you look like they're talking to somebody behind you, you know. You know, I'll tell him when he comes in, or sorry to say that to him, but not to me. I know what a no good Nick I am, you know. And then you begin to recognize, especially, uh, or if you've had the opportunity to be around a being who is a pure mirror, that is a non judgmental person who you look at in the eyes and you can see that they see all your crap and they are all right here, and yeah, and here we are. It's that story which I told before, but uh, of the night uh, when I was at the temple in Kenshi, and I um, thought about wanting to give money to a lama, and I just thought about it, and then I got into my sleeping bag. It was very cold, and I started to have all these sexual fantasies. And I had these fantasies of how I'd use my yoga powers for sexual conquest. And the fantasies were so intense that I ended up having an orgasm. And the next morning, I was called to my guru, who was 12 miles away. And I came up to him, and he looked at me, and he says, you want to give money to a lama? And I said, yes. And he says, very good. And he hit me on the head, and he told everybody. And I was basking in all this. And then suddenly, I thought, holy mackerel. If he knows that, he knows that, and I couldn't look at him. And when I finally looked at him, he was just looking at me with total love and compassion. Right? Sure, and here we are. Okay. Because a person, a dispassionate person, can look at all the stuff of the universe and say, yes. And there's none of your stuff, no matter what your stuff is, that is more than that. It's just more stuff. It's not, it's my stuff. I mean, 
You may think it's all stuff, but I haven't told you my stuff yet. Now, the next little flip that occurs once the faith starts to get stronger, so you're willing to sit in the marketplace and roast, realizing that all that will burn away is what's burnable, and that who you are is not burnable, right? So that you're not vulnerable, and that's what Christ's message was. He says, go ahead, what are you going to do? Spit on me, laugh at me, jeer at me, what do you want to do? Nail me up, go ahead. That isn't who I am. Go ahead, it'll make you happy, go ahead, here. You know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Because Christ was reminding us. That's what he did. He reminded us that we aren't that which suffers. And that's the profound flip that occurs when you recognize that suffering is grace. And that's a big one. When you realize that suffer, the only reason you're suffering is because you're holding. You've got a secret stash of attachment somewhere or you wouldn't be suffering. No attachment, no suffering. You're only suffering because you think it ought to be other than the way it is. Now, it's all nice and easy to do talk about that when the suffering's a little one. But like in dealing with Wavy, Wavy has a spinal problem that keeps him in excruciating pain almost all the time. And that's tough sadhana to convert that pain. Physical pain, see, that's the one most people are afraid of. And that's where the dying fear is, the fear of pain. And the, I had this experience with this woman that was dying in Los Angeles, where I sat next to her, she was in the final stages of dying, really, from uh, cancer of the nervous system. And it was all through her groin, all through her thighs and her stomach, and she was rubbing her legs with a look of excruciating pain on her face as if she were experiencing that. And I just sat in front of her, and at first, because I've loved her and I've known her, I was going through all my emotional reactions to her pain. And then I quieted down and I did Buddhist cemetery meditation, that is, watching the decaying body and watching the pain and watching it all and sitting right with it and being quiet inside. And I got quieter and quieter because... I was working, this is a tantric thing, I was working with the intense energy of that pain and my pity and converting that energy so there was a tremendous amount in it. So as I got into this deep space, it got very, very deep and very quiet. And she all the time is writhing in pain and she turns to me and she says, I'm feeling so peaceful. She said, I don't know what you're doing, but I just feel in total peace. And all the time, the body is writhing in pain, and the personality is struggling, and behind it, we are. And there's no pain, and there's no suffering. And at that moment, she and I were the happiest beings in Los Angeles, I think. We were totally blissed out at that moment. The whole room was luminous, and we were just sitting together in this place of total peace, and all the time, she was struggling with this body. But that wasn't who she was being. That was merely happening. In the same way your heart beats, but you're not beating your heart. So the process is taking the stuff of daily life and giving space to just how it is and taking that energy and converting it and working with it, working with your desires, working with your fear, working with your loneliness. When you're lonely, instead of trying not to be lonely, be lonely. If you're depressed, far out I'm depressed. Hell, isn't it? And here we are depressed. Wow. You know, I spent years trying to not be how I was. And in order to come to see you, I would have to take a lot of things in the men's room to get ready to be beautiful. Because, as Trunkbo would say, I was working out of a philosophy of poverty rather than of riches. 
Philosophy of Riches says, I am what I am, and here it is, and here we all are, being just what we are, and it's enough. And when we'll be something else, we'll be something else, and that'll be fine, too. Meaning giving space to your being as it is. Now, don't let what I'm saying imply that I'm against any kind of systems, methods, ashrams, gurus, yogas of any kind. These are all exquisite training fields, and I personally avail myself of many of them. I sit zazen in sashins. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be sitting in Southern Buddhist meditation for 10 or 12 days with many beings. Uh, I've been studied with many, many different yogic techniques. And I can understand the value of the Sufi dance and the Zen sitting and on and on and on. And they each have an exquisite function. And you've got to listen in your heart to find out whether that's right on for you. The proselytizing is impure when you come on that it's good for someone else. All you can say to someone else is listen to your heart. You'll know what's good for you. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.